Hey, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we're talking about the hit film, the documentary cessationism. We're specifically responding to the sections of the video on prophecy. You guys stay tuned. It's going to be a great program. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a show where we tackle history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. My name is Joshua Lewis. I'm the pastor of King's Fellowship in Ada, Oklahoma, together with my friends Michael Miller at Reclamation Church Denver and Michael Roundtree at Bridgeway Church OKC. We set aside time every week to discuss the gifts of the Spirit. Things like, how should we pray for the sick? And and how do we interpret tongues? And should we believe all the prophetic words for the new year? If you're looking for a charismatic podcast with practitioners who are actually doing the stuff, this is the show for you. Well, we've got a great program for you guys today. Uh, if you're not familiar with our response to the cessationist documentary, you just, you've just you been living under a rock. We just we don't know where you've been. Uh, you need to be tuning in. We've got a playlist going. we got Dr. Sam Storms on, uh, on the playlist. Uh, we've got uh, the three of us, obviously, on that playlist. Next week, I think... Yeah, next week we're going to be interviewing Dr. Michael Brown. He's going to be engaging with this playlist as well. We're going, trying to be as faithful as we can to engage with all of the, I want to say arguments, but they're not really arguments. They are more like uh, the cessationists are saying things about continuationism without really engaging with the things that we're saying and teaching. They do quote Wayne Grudem here, uh, but they don't seem to engage with the proof texts that he doesn't just say this is what prophecy is, but then he gives biblical examples for why he believes this about prophecy. Those things just aren't engaged with in the documentary. So we thought as continuationists who've read most of these scholars, we thought we would uh, dive in and kind of give the response that cessationists or continuationists have believed uh, and practiced uh, for quite a while now. And, And we thought we would be able to kind of give it in a medium that was on video format since people don't do any of that fancy book learning no more. I want to introduce you to my co hosts Michael Roundtree. Do you have anything you want to say about today's program that would be uh, important for the introduction of our discussion? Uh, No, nothing important. I just love your little uh, fancy book learning. I think you got that from the Lutheran satire on the Trinity, the YouTube video. Probably did. I don't need none of your fancy book learning. Which if you haven't seen that, that's like one of the best. So good. I haven't Uh, seen it. Look up Lutheran satire (laughs) on the Trinity. Surely you have. You've never, no, you've never seen, seen that. That's Come modalism, on, Patrick. Patrick. <laughs> oh wait, maybe, maybe I have. Maybe I have seen that. Yeah, you, I don't know. You would know. It's been a bit. Anyway, uh, other than that, hey, it's Reformation Day. I have a reformer. He's kind of cut off right here. There's Calvin right there. Uh, yeah, Reformation Day. So you know, every Reformation Day, people celebrate it by knocking on my door and asking for candy. It's kind of a weird weird deal do you ever actually uh, give them a trick instead of a treat (laughs) no set fire to their basket or something (laughs) no (laughs) it's like the reverse of like the the brown bag on fire on the porch (laughs) Uh, okay Okay, uh, this is why we don't take programs early in the morning miller do you have anything to say (laughs) That's not about poop in kids on on fire poop in kids uh, <laughs> yeah, Halloween buckets. Uh, so, maybe something so about the documentary, preferably. Yes. yes. One thing is incredibly clear: none of the guys that they bring on this actually interact with any of the scholarly material. They give one no. single quote that they found no, no, in no. Grudem's Grudem. systematic theology, but they really aren't even interacting with it. Uh, that's really it's just disappointing it's so disingenuous this lacks actual scholarship so from scholars apparently i I don't get it that's it i'll say the things that i kind of expected both of you guys to say uh cessationists are brothers we love you uh we're just engaging with your arguments (laughs) the guys who made the documentary if you're out there you want to engage with us uh man this is what like video seven or eight now so as we've been cranking out this content responding to we want to make sure in case you didn't watch those videos and you're only watching this video we want you to know there's an open invitation you can come on engage with us uh, i've been talking to tim actually going to send him some books uh from our side uh as as a way to engage with some of that material so i'm actually excited we've opened up some dialogue we're discussing we're engaging with one another i'd love to have you guys on remnant and you can promote the the, the documentary you can discuss it uh here uh, uh, and, and engage with us on some of these arguments uh, as we dive into all of this. Okay, let's jump into clip one about prophecy. Uh, can prophets miss it? 
The biblical word that we translate as prophet literally means mouthpiece. The prophet became God's functional mouth by which God would speak. God used the man as an instrument to immediately deliver his exact message. Not by bypassing the prophet's mind, but by preserving the exact words that God intended for him to speak. A true prophet could not speak error in the name of the Lord, because God supernaturally protects his own message. Well, this uh, ultimately, I mean, not, uh, you guys can clearly detect this. This has to do with prophets being able to miss it. Can you miss a prophetic word? Can you uh, misunderstand what's being said? Here, the uh, cessationist movie is saying that the prophets in the Old Testament uh, and in the New Testament, uh, they get direct revelation from heaven. It's clear. Uh, it's precise. It's protected uh, so, so one, when it comes to you, it's it's extremely clear. You can understand it. You can hear it. You can make sense of it. Uh, and because of that, you will clearly articulate it in a way uh, that is consistent with the revelation that had been given to you. So uh, let me just toss it over to uh, Roundtree. Roundtree, are there Bible verses that undermined this idea that prophecy is always clear, upfront, uh, everyone, if God is speaking, you definitely know that he's speaking. There's a level of clarity and perspicuity to it uh, that there's no way to confuse or distort. Uh, gosh, there are so many verses that go against this. Um, Numbers chapter 12, when Moses is describing the nature of prophecy, he says that God speaks to a prophet, uh, a prophet in mysteries and riddles. Uh, not so with my servant Moses, with him. God speaks face to face. Moses was unique in his uh, in his direct and clear revelation from God. But the, the actual point of the verse is that your run of the mill prophets, if you will, your non Moses prophets, don't get it so clearly. In fact, it's a mystery. It's a riddle. It needs to be interpreted, uh, and that carries over. Uh, we, well, we see it in the book of Job to Job 33. God does speak now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. Uh, and so we, we see once again, like, hey, if it's really clear, everybody really understands it. I mean, even in the incarnation, you can only get clearer than Jesus, the word of God. But most people missed him. And so the actual very nature of God's revelation is most miss it. And, uh, and, it, and if they want to say, well, but that's, uh, that's for unbelievers. I would still point them, like, you know, like unbelievers miss the incarnation. Uh, I'd still point them to numbers 12, where it's talking about like just the very nature of prophecy is a mystery and a riddle. Um, I, I would disagree with the, the teaching that it's taught throughout scripture that prophets can't, uh, ever err. Uh, we've shown how second Samuel chapter seven violates that. Uh, we can one well, of you can hop into that one if you want to. Uh, Acts twenty one four also violates that, but cessationists like to change the definitions. Uh, it says in Acts twenty one four that through the Spirit, uh, these people told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Well, Paul was clearly supposed to go to Jerusalem because in Acts uh, nineteen he resolved in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Acts twenty he was compelled or constrained. Uh, the word could be translated arrested by the spirit to go to Jerusalem. So the spirit clearly want to go to Paul to go to Jerusalem, but Acts 21, four through the spirit, they said, don't go to Jerusalem. And uh, that language through the spirit is Luke's language for prophesy. He uses the same language in Acts 11 of Agabus. When Agabus says uh, through the spirit that there will be a famine coming over the entire Roman world, every cessationist says, oh yeah, he's prophesying there. Well, he's prophesying, and that's Luke's language for it, through the Spirit. So Acts 21.4, through the Spirit, they command, uh, or, or they say, don't go to Jerusalem, and they're wrong. They miss a prophecy. Well, what's happening? What's happening is they muddled the message. They had an accurate revelation. There's danger in Jerusalem. But by the time they fashioned this into a prophecy, the complete and accurate and perfect revelation from God that there's danger in Jerusalem, they muddled it along the way and prophesied, spoke through the Spirit that he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. And that's really kind of unpacked in uh, sort of Acts 21, 10, and 11, where Agabus just says, what will happen? Uh, danger in Jerusalem. And everyone else tries to compel him to stay. And Paul says, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? 
I'm compelled not only to go to Jerusalem, but to die there. And so uh, it, Luke is kind of unpacking in this section of verses, uh, Acts 21, 1 through 11, what prophecy looks like in the church. And the way it looks is prophets can muddle the message and it doesn't make them false prophets. And what cessationists want to do is they just want to say, oh, well, uh, that wasn't prophecy. Well, then what do you do with Luke's parallel language in Acts 11 through the Spirit? Uh, what do you do with the fact that the whole context of Acts 21, 1 through 11 is prophecy? Well, it was just an impression from God. Uh, okay, uh, where'd you get that word? Uh, so it, it's very clearly a prophecy. They changed the definitions. A uh, couple of more things, and I'll get off my soapbox. Um, they say, hey, the prophet, you know, this Hebrew word, it means he's the mouthpiece. Totally agree with that. Prophet's a mouthpiece of God. You can't extrapolate from that, that because he's the mouthpiece, that he says everything perfectly. That's an extrapolation you made up. Uh, think of it like this. The church is the body of Christ. That means that we express Christ on the earth. Uh, let me ask my cessationist brothers and sisters, do you express Christ on the earth perfectly? Does your church express Christ on the earth perfectly? Does the universal church of Jesus Christ express Christ on the earth perfectly? No, we don't. No, it's uh, an image that communicates the body of Christ. We express Christ, not necessarily perfectly. Mouthpiece. Yes, we communicate God's words, not necessarily perfectly. That's an extrapolation based on your own interpretation. We would have to go to other passages of Scripture to come to that conclusion. I have more, but I'll give you guys time to talk. Yeah, let me dive in with just some verses about um, Revelation coming in a kind of muddled way. You quoted Numbers, you quoted Job, talking about how, uh, you know, God speaks here way, their way, though man may not perceive it. I remind uh, listeners to go check out John chapter 12, where God speaks from heaven. Um, I have glorified my name, I will glorify it again, right? And those who are standing by, some heard it thunder, some heard an angel speak, and then John records that it was the voice of God. So we have an account where this is actually the clearest form of revelation, the audible spoken word of God from the heavens, and people misunderstood what was happening. They misconstrued what was happening. We have in Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter uh, has in, having a revelation. He falls into a trance, a kind of dreamlike visionary state where the pigs in a blanket come down from the heavens. And when they come down, it says that he is perplexed when he wakes up. What's the meaning of this dream? He was perplexed by it. He didn't understand what it meant. So again, we've got Old Testament verses. We've got New Testament verses. And there's more than just that. Uh, these are just some to suggest that, hey, just because God is speaking doesn't mean that there is a level of uh, there's a there's a kind of inability um, to misunderstand that revelation. For example, here's a prime example. I'm holding within my hands a Bible. This Bible is God's written revelation. It is infallible. It is inerrant. Uh, this word, uh, I believe, is living and active. There's not an error in it. It's carried down the message of the apostles and the prophets that's kind of co-written by the Holy Spirit and has been put into my hands. And yet, me and my Presbyterian brothers who are on this video critiquing continuationism, we disagree about baptism. Uh, me and my uh, uh, you know, uh, other Christian brothers and sisters who are egalitarian, I disagree with them on this doctrinal issue, but they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. But we both disagree on what the written revelation of Scripture says. Uh, some people practice intinction, you know, other people uh, 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 practice a, a kind of memorial view of communion. Others uh, believe in kind of a real presence. We all deliberate on modes and ways that we deliver communion and the meaning of what communion actually is. And yet the scriptures are infallible and inerrant revelation. The doctrine of perspicuity doesn't mean that all areas of scripture are perfectly understood and there can never be any form, form of confusion around the scriptures. The doctrine of perspicuity is saying that all things pertaining to a just life and a justified state and, and true faith and knowing the true God can be found and clearly understood in the scriptures. But it's not to say that all things are easy to understand in that same way, in the same way that this is super clear and yet can still be misunderstood, we are arguing that prophecy in a like manner is a revelation from God, like this is a revelation from God, and it can be misunderstood. Not only do we have Bible verses that say this, we have Bible verses that live this out, both, both prescriptive and descriptive text. 
explaining this. Uh, Miller, I have monologued. Michael has monologued. I invite you. Monologue. To monologue. <laughs> I would actually argue that prophecy can be even more so easily misunderstood. Uh, the written word is actually word for word, whereas prophecy, we see that Michael quoted that passage in Numbers 12. It says, with uh, Moses, God spoke face to face, not so with all the other prophets. With them, dark mysteries, riddles, dreams, visions. But then you've also got uh, Deuteronomy 34, which I find is, is really compelling um, because you've got Moses who speaks with God face to face, handing the baton off to Joshua because he's not going to go across the Jordan. Um, they, they have to go on without him because of the, the sin that he had committed. And so here it says, now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. It's at the very end of Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 9 uh, through 12. It says, for Moses had placed his hands on him, and the Israelites listened to him and did just what the Lord had commanded Moses. No prophet ever again arose in Israel like Moses, who knew the Lord face to face. Catch the uh, hyperlink here. Every time you go to 1 Corinthians 13 and you hear that the perfect coming face to face language, it's talking about this kind of interaction with God. He did all the signs and wonders the Lord had sent him to do in Egypt to Pharaoh, all of his servants in the whole land, and displayed great power and awesome might in the view of all of Israel. So it gives you a number of qualifiers for how Joshua was not like Moses. Moses got to hear God face to face, uh, whereas Joshua didn't have that kind of interaction with God. It would often come, and along with all the other prophets and the, the subsequent line of prophets throughout Israel, none of them would speak with God face to face. Um, I think of like, you know, Jeremiah, who's one of the great prophets, um, in Jeremiah 32, he, well, throughout the book of Jeremiah, he's confronting the false prophets, which we'll probably get into in uh, uh, Jeremiah 23 in particular when we deal with Deuteronomy 18, uh, which is one of their arguments in a later video. But, but at least in Jeremiah 32, you see Jeremiah, uh, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Go and buy this field that's in Anathoth. You have the right of redemption to purchase it. So he goes, he makes his way over to Anathoth. He runs into his uncle's son, also known as his cousin. Uh, who tells them, hey, buy this field that's an Anathoth. You have a right of redemption to purchase it. The land is yours. And then it says these interesting words. Then I knew it was the Lord. Um, but then you've also got just a number of other prophecies with Jeremiah. Like he says, he looks over there and he sees a... a but Miller, unpack that for see? a second. Then I knew it was the Lord. Why, why are you bringing that up? Because is it's because that Jeremiah didn't know that the word of the Lord that came to him was in fact the word of the Lord. Like I just right. want to make and sure that the listener out. didn't skip past that. Jeremiah, the prophet who wrote one of the biggest prophetic books in the Bible, had God speaking to him and he didn't know it was God speaking to him until he acted on what God told him to say and do. Right. And then you've also got Jeremiah, uh, at, at, early on in his ministry, he, he's looking at a tree. The Lord says, what do you see? He says, well, I see the budding of an almond tree. And the Lord says, you see correctly. And then he begins to explain what he's seeing. And it's actually like a play on words in the Hebrew that's going to prophesy to Israel. And then you've got other prophets like, uh, well, I mentioned this because, again, he doesn't know what God is showing him. God has to unpack and interpret what he's actually seeing. Um, you've got other examples like Daniel. I think Daniel 9 and 10 is incredibly compelling because here Daniel has been given this vision or dream. He has no idea what it means, right? So there's a lack of clarity around what God is trying to convey to Daniel, a well-known prophet. And matter of fact, the, the clarity, for three weeks he's left in this state. Now, the moment he began to pray, there was an angel sent to, to give him an interpretation uh, of this message. But that angel was even contested and was upheld by the prince of Persia for three weeks. So there's like this battle in the heavenlies over this uh, um, over this vision. And he has to go back and get, I think it was Michael the archangel, to, to make it all the way there and give Daniel the interpretation. So for three weeks, Daniel's sitting on the sword of the Lord, but he has no idea what it means, which is actually in fulfillment of everything that Moses talked about. Um, with, God, with Moses, God speaks to face. With all the other prophets... It, it's it's muddled it's riddled yeah. it, it's dark sayings and uh -huh. it, michael you're gonna say something oh uh, well yeah but finish your thought oh I, I just the point i'm trying to make here is when they say you see the video right it's super clear you see oh god's word comes into their head and then right out their mouth but they don't mention any of the process that's happening in their head because it's not like god is speaking word for word as man speaks to man face to face he's actually speaking in a vision and so this thing is kind of lodged in his head until God comes with another revelation and gives him an interpretation. 
And then oftentimes he's like, what do you want me to do with this? Oh, well, right. go Jeremiah and speak. And they're still not going to listen to you. Right. <laughs> so it's, well, it's, and, there's and a whole lot fair, there. Like, I, I'm sure you would agree. Sometimes it would come in a vision. Sometimes it would come in a dream. Uh, sometimes it, it might come in sentence structure, you know? Uh, right. So like when they say the word of the Lord came to me, it probably did come in some kind of, we don't really know. It actually doesn't tell us how it came. Does that mean that they saw sentences that they, does that mean that like God audibly spoke it and then they conveyed it? We, we don't know, but to your point, even when such a firm statement as the word of the Lord came to me is used in Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah doesn't know that he knows that he knows that it's the word of the Lord until Hananel offers to buy that field, which is how the story plays out. Uh, I don't know how they get around that. Yeah. yeah the, the, the very, the very clear statement, then I knew it was the Lord. This is a sequence of events. <laughs> and the word then literally implies when he knew. He knew after right. all everything and had it, come to it, pass. And it all stands in contrast to the clarity or perspicuity of Scripture, where Paul says in Ephesians 6, like, hey, teach. He's, he says, children, obey your parents. Like, he expects children to understand the Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the way we express our love for the Lord is by talking about these commandments with our children everywhere we go. And so uh, so the Scriptures are clear. They make wise the simple. Uh, but prophecy is muddled. It is mysterious. That's why they did miss and muddle the message in Acts 21.4. Uh, and some of these other places, as we've talked about before. Uh, one more thing, because Michael, you made a big point, and this is kind of the thought that was coming to me as you were speaking. You made a big point about the uniqueness of Moses. And uh, amongst all the Old Testament prophets, I would say, yes, Moses was the most unique of them. Uh, but Samuel was also in a league of his own relative to other prophets. And in 1 Samuel 3, it says of him that none of his words fell to the ground. Now, if if you're not studying these things, you just kind of read through that like, oh, wow, cool. Sam was a great prophet. Uh, but you just keep reading. You don't think about it. But just pause for a moment and think about the fact that he says that. If the cessationist definition of prophecy is true, there's no reason to say it. It's a redundancy. The cessationist definition is no words of any true prophet ever, 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 ever fall to the ground. So then why does he say it? That would be like saying, um, you know, uh, so-and-so is a quarterback who throws the ball. So-and-so is a fireman, and uh, and he put out fires. And uh, so-and-so was an accountant, and he crunched numbers. Like, wait, why are you saying that? Like, that's what an accountant does. It's what a fireman or a quarterback does. According to the cessationist definition, all a prophet does is they're just this mouthpiece of God that perfectly and inerrantly conveys God's words for every single prophet ever in history. None of their words fell to the ground, says the cessationist. There's no point in saying that about Samuel. Now, the truth is of Samuel that when it says none of his words fell to the ground, the reason he says it is because it was exceptional. It wasn't just a job description. It was exceptional. Like, hey, this guy was a serious prophet. None of his words fell to the ground. Some of these other prophets, the implication is that some of their words sometimes did fall to the ground. And uh, and so, but prophet, uh, but Samuel was exceptional among the prophets. And he oversaw a school of prophets. And you see this in the first Samuel 10, first Samuel 19. You'll see the same thing of Elijah and Elisha overseeing a school or a company of prophets and beginning of second Kings. Uh, Second Kings one and two and five and six, I think. So, uh, and so you see, like, there's this company of prophets, this group of prophets. But Samuel, as their head, none of his words fell to the ground. Uh, that's something that I I haven't heard cessationists ever uh, answer for. Honestly, I don't think most of them have thought about it. You know, I think what's interesting as well, and I just kind of thought about this as Miller was speaking as well. Miller, I like it when you monologue. It gives us both great ideas, me and Michael both. Um, but the, <laughs> or the things to correct, that's, one or the other. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, the phrase that's used in this documentary is the Old Testament word for prophet is Navi. The problem is there is not one Old Testament word in, in the Bible for prophet. Uh, in fact, I believe... Michael, the Rolodex of Scripture, can help me on this. Um, I think it's Second Chronicles 
is it 29 29 where it talks about all of this it's like the last chapter all of these are written in samuel the seer or samuel the prophet gad the seer nathan the prophet and all three of those words for prophet are different words and they're like hosen uh navi and and the the one that they use is, is the navi and then the roe i think it is and i'm not pronouncing any of these words right i'm not a hebrew scholar uh but but there are different words most of the, oh, most of them, one of them being this kind of bubble forth, the Navi mouthpiece kind of imagery. The other one having to do more with visions and dreams, things that the Bible explicitly says are more cryptic and hard to understand. I think it's interesting that they don't engage at all with this idea that there is a kind of revelatory seeing kind of prophet, like Samuel was a seer, because those verses that talk about the dreamers and the seers there are explicit verses where they need interpretation for those dreams. God spoke to them in the midst of a dream, and yet there still needs to be interpretation for that. Now, some would say, well, that's not prophecy, that's dreams, and God's speaking to someone through dreams. But the category that's given in the New Testament for prophetic revelation in Joel chapter 2 is a kind of umbrella uh, of any kind of revelatory gift. Remember, he says, a part of spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And this is in Joel 2. So I said the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament. The Old Testament defines this. Uh, the, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and young men will have visions on male and female servants in those days. I'll pour out my spirit, right? So he quotes uh, in the Old Testament that, there, that there's going to be a kind of prophecy that includes dreams and visions. So it comes within that category, within that umbrella of the prophetic gift. So as much as I want to say um, yes and amen that God speaks to us, he actually speaks to us in lots of different ways. And I think that the, the, the documentary intentionally only looks at one of the ways God speaks because it's easier to defend maybe the fact that God only speaks this way and that, uh, uh, that it's infallible, right? Because the right. other kinds of ways that God speaks, it's, it's clear uh, that it's clear that it's unclear. Uh, anyway, uh, you guys have anything yeah, you want to add on this? Uh, first, first Chronicles twenty nine twenty nine uses three different words to describe a prophetic person. Although a lot of English translations will only use two of those words, but in the Hebrew, it is three different words. Uh, but yeah, Josh, let's go look at the next clip. Van de Thanks for looking that up, Michael. Appreciate it. Um, boom. And so those who come claiming to speak on God's behalf in the name of God with the very word of God are held to very, very, very high standards of accountability. And those who are proven false ended up, therefore, having to suffer very, very, very high forms of, of punishment as a result. In biblical times, if you get up and you speak in God's name and that's not God's word, you were stoned to death. But today somebody does that and either it's inconsequential. My exports must not be going all the way uh, exporting. Uh, it's inconsequential. There's no reprimand. He's, he goes on to say, you should at least excommunicate these people. Um, if you're not going to stone them, you got to do something about it. So I'll just kind of pick up from, from that clip there. Um, I would say on, on this front end, if my charismatic brothers and sisters are watching, um, I actually do want you to care about prophecy and i want you to care about getting up and saying thus saith the lord i want you to care that there are a group of youtube prophets that stand up and give vague and or false words every single year and um we just kind of pretend like it's not happening we still do conferences with these people we still buy their books we don't write the publishers when these people keep propagating their content like i i would say that as a whole um, this is actually kind of a wake up call to the charismatic movement. Like we, we as a group need to kind of wake up and police ourselves. Uh, we've gotten into a place where if you do the stuff and I do the stuff, we won't critique one another in any way. Uh, we won't challenge each other, sharpen each other. Um, but I think that that has to stop because, uh, the best argument for cessationism is bad exercises of continuationism right that's the best argument and that's the only thing that and by the way it's an ad hominem argument it's not a consistent logical a uh, biblically based argument it's ad hominem it goes after the character and in practice of something rather than its biblical uh, mandatedness in the scriptures right so it is ad hominem so it's not a good argument but it is absolutely the best argument and the argument that is used in this documentary over and over again uh, because it's the only thing that can hold up this case so for for those of you who are watching to the to the charismatic to the continuationist can we as a community kind of commit 
to a kind of zeal to protect this gift and pursue this gift, an authentic representation of this gift that is true and honest and and dignified. Um, I, I think that God is definitely calling us to do that. I say dignified. I think you know what I mean. Um, not to use this flippantly for our own personal gain, uh, which is certainly something that we see in the scriptures and I think is happening today as well. Miller, it looks like you're trying to say something, but you are muted, my friend. You want to jump in there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got kids yeah. that are getting ready for school and yelling at me from upstairs. He was making uh, uh, I got to get out of the basement, guys. Point. Just got to get out. <laughs> yeah, I was making a moot point. Very nice, Michael. Um, okay, so he, while I actually, I think this is a good admonition, right? We, we do have way too many YouTube prophets out there that have absolutely no accountability. People are still buying their books, still watching their videos, and they need to stop. Um, and, and this actually is reminiscent of what we see in Scripture with false prophets in Jeremiah's day. But but we need to start with the argument. The biblical argument he's making is, hey, and in, in, in the Old Testament and, and the days, you know, when, of uh, of Moses, if a prophet got a word wrong, that prophet was stoned to death. Okay, uh, one, we we don't actually see that. Um, we, we see Deuteronomy 13, where it says, if a prophet gets it right um, and leads you to worship other gods, that prophet gets stoned. Um, but when you look at the example in the Old Testament, do you know the only people they stoned were actually the true prophets? <laughs> you don't find any false prophets being stoned. Now, that's probably a failure to carry out the law. Uh, I, I recognize that. So the other passage they're going to pull from is actually Deuteronomy 18. But let me back up to Deuteronomy 13, uh, just because I think there's an important, important point to be made that, that's a learning point for all involved. Um, people will look at the accuracy of a prophet, and they'll go, ooh, ah. And that's, that's, what they'll, that's what's so deceiving about a false prophet. It's not that they get it wrong. It's that they get it right. A person who's getting a, prof a prophecy wrong, I mean, it's like it's easy to dismiss that person by and large. A person who's getting it right, now that's a little bit more scary and tricky to deal with because that person is actually capable of deceiving you because of the power that's being displayed. They have a dream. They have a vision. Those They predict things that actually come to pass. They perform signs and wonders. But in the process of doing that, they lead you away to other gods. And Jesus speaks of these false prophets and he says, you'll know them by their fruit. Um, so Jeremiah 23, we actually see a number of, of criteria that get applied to the false prophets. Um, let me give you just three things. One, they commit evil sins and lead others into sin. Okay. Two, they lead people away from God to other gods. And then three, they give encouragement to people who are doing evil with the result that they don't stop their evil doing. In Jeremiah's day, this is what was happening. They were prophesying, peace, peace. Babylonians aren't coming. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, and yet, Jeremiah has to confront these prophets and saying, hey, you're, you're prophesying rebellion to God. Uh, these things you're saying, this peace, peace thing, you're actually not pointing people back to the laws of God. You're not pointing them back to being faithful to the covenant. You're doing just the opposite. You're affirming their sin and, and, and acting as though everything's going to be fine and you can continue worshiping these other gods. These are the kinds of people that are false prophets. But, but then they don't give any kind of categorization in this video of people who are intentionally trying to point people back to Yahweh, but then get it wrong. People who, um, who prophesy something that ends up being wrong, who are also willing to clean up their mess and go, oh my gosh, that was wrong. Here you go. Let me, let me make this right. They don't give any examples of that in scripture. And that's because we don't have... Yeah. Uh, well, we have examples of that in Scripture. They don't have those examples, and they'll dismiss those examples and redefine them and say, oh, that's not prophecy. Yeah. Miller, Michael, I, you unpacked Deuteronomy. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say the same thing, Josh. Uh, Miller, in a moment, I'd like to have you uh, uh, unpack Deuteronomy 18. And guys, I'm asking Miller to do it because Miller has preached recently through Deuteronomy. And for our viewers out there, just so you know, there are charismatic Christians who do th crazy things like preach through the book of Deuteronomy. Like that's not just something I'm doing Habakkuk. That, right. Or Josh is in Habakkuk. I'm in Acts and Psalms. Uh, and so like, yeah, there, there are charismatic Christians who preach through the Bible. It's a caricature to suggest otherwise. 
Uh, so Miller, we'll come back to you on Deuteronomy 18, let you unpack that in a moment. But I want to kind of continue a thought that you started on before we come back to uh, chapter 18. So the, the thought that you thought that you started on was, well, we do have examples of prophets having to clean up their mess and uh, prophets missing it, not getting stoned or having severe consequences and those kinds of things. If their heart is really after God, because to be clear, every instance of a false prophet in scripture is of an unbeliever, wicked, leading on leading God's people away or attempting to lead God's people away from true worship of Yahweh. That's every example. It's never somebody who like with a good heart for God yeah. missed the prophecy and, and was held accountable and cleaned it up afterward. There, there's no instance of that person experiencing severe repercussions. But uh, I mentioned the New, uh, New Testament example of Acts 21, 4, where cessationists redefine that as not actual prophecy with no justification. Uh, then, uh, then the other one is uh, we can go Old Testament. And this is going to touch a little bit on uh, a future video with two different views, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, of Old Testament prophecy. Our view is different from what Justin Peters will articulate it in a soon video. But let me just unpack 2 Samuel 7. King David wants to build a house for the Lord. He wants to build a temple. And, and so he calls for Nathan the prophet, hey, can I build this temple? And Nathan the prophet says, Yahweh is with you. Do whatever's in your heart. And then the Lord comes to Nathan next, you know, that night in a dream says, yo, bro, what the heck are you doing? No, don't tell him that you got to go clean this up. Go tell David that he's not going to be the one to build the house of the Lord. But I like that that's in your heart, David. You wanted to build a house for me. Therefore, David, I'm going to build your house. That is your legacy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Christ is going to come through your line and your son is going to build the temple, etc. So that's Second Samuel 7 in a nutshell. Now. Here's the deal. Nathan missed a prophecy. He missed a prophecy. And here's why you know, cessationists want to say, well, it's not a prophecy because he didn't use the formula, thus says the Lord. Well, let me ask you, cessationist siblings in Christ, where does it say in the scripture that every time an Old Testament prophet prophesied, they had to use the language of thus says the Lord? It doesn't. We have many examples in the Old Testament of people prophesying without using that language. I mean, I, just just look it up for yourself. There's countless examples. I don't know one coming to mind right now. I think it's First Kings 22 and Micaiah. Uh, uh, Micaiah prophesies without using "thus says the Lord" language. And uh, but there are many, uh, and he'll just say, "The Lord is with you." And um, and so now in that instance, that just popped in my mind. My, Micaiah, he's kind of being sarcastic with the king and. Uh, it comes back later. But the point is they interpreted it as prophecy, even though he didn't use the language of thus says the Lord, because that wasn't an a fixed verbatim formula. It was a common formula, but it wasn't an every time formula uh, whenever a prophet would speak. So uh, you can't just say just because he, so, but here's what he does say. And, and here's why we should interpret this as prophecy. In the ancient world, just like a president had members of his cabinet who would offer him counsel, uh, pagan nations would have court magicians and astrologers think um, like Pharaoh and the Egyptian sorcerers. They would surround him to offer spiritual counsel. Even in the New Testament in Acts 13, where you have Elimas the sorcerer surrounding Sergius Paulus, the, uh, the proconsul of the region. This was just how they operated. Well, Israel operated this way also, but they did, uh, but they put prophets of Yahweh in that place. That was Nathan's role. He was part of David's cabinet. He was part of David's spiritual counsel. When David wanted to hear from the Lord, he called on the prophet and he said, prophesy to me, should I do this thing? And that's exactly when David calls Nathan forward to make the most important decision in his kingship, in his reign. I can I build this temple of the Lord? Nothing is more important to David than this. The biggest decision. And he calls on his go-to prophet his spiritual counselor, his cabinet member, and says, tell me what the Lord's heart is on this. And when Nathan says, Yahweh is with you, do whatever's in your heart, guys, he's prophesying. And if you're a cessationist and saying he's not prophesying, you are protecting your doctrine. You're protecting it. So stop it. This is so clearly prophecy. Nathan missed it. And guess what? He didn't get stoned. He got rebuked by the Lord. He was held accountable by the Lord. So to the cessationist point, there should be accountability. But Nathan knew the Lord. He wasn't trying to lead David astray from Yahweh. He missed it. And so 
there's an example of an Old Testament miss, just like we've given an example of a New Testament miss, neither of which came with uh, somebody getting stoned or excommunicated. Uh, okay, Miller, why don't you hop in with the Deuteronomy 18? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I'm just going to quote the verse just so people know this. Again, this, the context of this passage in Deuteronomy 17 and 18, Moses is sort of unpacking the various authority positions in Israel. And so he speaks about the, the, the elders uh, over uh, different regions in Israel. Uh, these elders would function as judges. And he's basically saying, hey, here's what a good judge looks like. Here's what a bad judge looks like. And then he goes to the next office that's going to function in Israel, that being the, the priesthood or the Levite, uh, Levitical tribe that's uh, participating in um, uh, temple sacrifice. And, and then they will also function as sort of the high court of appeals, the high part of the judicial system, Supreme Court, so to speak. And he says, here's what a, a good priest is going to look like. Here's what a bad priest is going to look like. And then he talks about the kings of Israel. And again, it's like, here's what a good king is going to look like. Here's what a bad king is going to look like. And then he mentions prophets, which is another like sort of executive position, uh, executive court, uh, if you will, in Israel. Here's what a good uh, prophet's going to look like. Here's what a bad prophet's going to look like. And so that's the the context of this. Um, this is Deuteronomy 18, verses uh, 15 through 22. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your Israelites. You must listen to him. This is in accordance with what you what happened at Horeb on the day of the assembly. You asked the Lord your God, please do not make us hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore or see this great fire anymore lest we die. Then the Lord said to me, what they have said is good. Now just a, a little backdrop here. Uh, what happened at Horeb? Well, all the Israelites had just come out of Egypt. Um, they're now meeting with God on the mountain. They're seeing the billowing smoke. They're seeing the fire. They're hearing the thunder, the, the loud noises. They're terrified and they're going to die. And they say, you know what, Moses? We think it'd be better that you go up there and listen to God for us, uh, and you just come and tell us what He says. So they actually they they're actually giving up this unique position of all nations to actually meet with their God, uh, but instead they send Moses up to sort of be the delegate. And so Moses says, "That's fine, okay." But what they said is good. So here's what God's response is: It says, "I will raise up a prophet like you." Uh, for them among their fellow Israelites, I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them whatever I command. I will personally hold responsible anyone who pays no attention to the words of that, pro that prophet speaks in my name. But if any prophet presumes to speak anything in my name that I have not authorized him to speak or speaks in the name of other gods, check that other gods caveat, uh, that prophet must die. Now, if you say to yourselves, how can we tell the message that is not from the Lord? Well, when a prophet speaks in my name and that prediction is not fulfilled, then I've not spoken it. The prophet has presumed to speak it, so you need not fear him. Well, the, the need not fear that prophet, that right there is, is a little caveat to what he said earlier. You're required to obey this prophet. And so the question, that, and this has been a highly debated passage, um, and there's basically two theories about this. Uh, the question here is, who is that prophet? Um, some people will say, and this is a position I think I used to hold, that this was solely about a unique prophet that was coming like Moses, right? Because he says right there at the beginning, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. Uh, others will say, well, in, in the sense that he's a leader of Israel. Um, because again, you've got all of these various positions being talked about up and coming in Israel, right? You've got judges that are going to be in Israel that or elders. You've got uh, the priest, the Levitical priesthood that's going to be coming in. These are offices in Israel, and you got kings. So obviously, you're going to have a lineage of prophets that are going to be serving Israel uh, throughout the, the rest of the generations. And so you've got two theories. One, this is an eschatological figure like Moses. The other is a, a, uh, a lineage of prophets, right? You see this happening with, with uh, Joshua, right? Moses lays his hands on Joshua. Um, and I, I would actually make the contention that this is both. Um, matter of fact, all of those positions, all of the unique authority positions in Israel will be eschatological, right? Who is a, a judge able to judge perfectly um, like the Israelites were commanded, the, the judges in Israel commanded to do? Well, the only perfect judge is the Lord Jesus. He's going to judge the nations. Uh, and then it also mentions a king. Well, who's going to be a king that's perfect in his rule? Well, King Jesus. Who's going to be a, uh, a priest that's going to be like a high priest to make atonement for the people? King Jesus. He's going to be both the priest and the sacrifice. And then who's going to be a prophet uh, that's perfect? Well, King, uh, the, the prophet Jesus. And we know this because Acts chapter 3 spells this out. Peter says, hey, Jesus, he was the fulfillment of what Moses said, right? He's the prophet like Moses. So certainly this passage is referring to an eschatological figure, but it's also referring to a lineage of those kind of people coming. Um, and so 
the, the, the question then is, well, if this person gets it wrong, is he speaking presumptuously? Shouldn't you kill this prophet? Shouldn't this fall into that Deuteronomy 13 false prophet category? Well, again, I gave you the criteria of how this actually gets filled, fulfilled in Israeli law in the future. Who are the prophets? Well, Jeremiah 23 speaks this very explicitly. Again, I'm going to say it just to reemphasize. They commit evil sins and lead others to do so. They lead people away from God to other gods. They give encouragement to people who are doing evil with the result that they do not stop doing their evil. You know what's not mentioned in any of these? is a, po a prophet who says something presumptuous, kind of like Nathan did when it came to building the temple, but then goes, oh no, he has a dream. He says, hey, Moses, I made a mistake. I mean, David, I made a mistake. Uh, you're not the guy who's going to do it. What about that prophet? The one who's actually faithful to point people to the covenants, like Nathan, uh, but, but who gets something accidentally wrong. Uh, a prophet who's intentionally trying to serve the Lord, intentionally trying to point people back to the covenants and be faithful to Yahweh worship. Uh, what about that kind of prophet who speaks presumptuously, but then immediately comes back and cleans up his mess? Is that prophet a false prophet? I don't think so. Um, and you don't see that. You, the false prophets that rise up, we have examples of them. And again, go read Jeremiah 23. You're going to see plenty of examples and Jeremiah 28. Uh, many of, uh, you know, Han and I being one of them, Ahab and Zedekiah being others. So did I unpack that? All right, you guys, I know that was a little bit of a monologue Fantastic. for me. Fantastic. I would have interrupted you had you stumbled somewhere. I think you did great, man. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the best things about doing remnant is that we each have our own little hobby horses that we're able to pick up on and we don't have to be an expert in everything. I could just let Miller do the Deuteronomy 13 and 18. Uh, you do a fantastic job unpacking that when you do it, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, and I try to get through I, it fast think, too. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna add this gonna add this one little thing, and I think you did a great job, uh, Miller. Um, even that word presumptuously, though, like it's tied to a word like it's elsewhere translated, like arrogantly, proudly, like. Um, and I, I was trying to look kind of like up Jeremiah really 23 fast. and Jeremiah 28. <laughs> okay, well there you go. Yeah, but I I've seen it in a footnote of the Bible before, presumptuously, like or rebelliously, and. Um, and so, like, even even when it says, like, those who prophesy and miss it or prophesy in the name of false gods, it seems, uh, and do so presumptuously, like, it seems like that's all connected to me. Like, you're speaking, uh, you're, you're speaking these prophetic words, but it's, uh, but it's a, out of this heart of rebellion. So it's not even like Nathan, like a good heart. It's like a presumptuous rebellious, arrogant, uh, insolent sort of heart seems to be the root of that. So I, I think that's worth adding in there. Uh, cool. So should we w w watch a, another clip, Josh? I say we watch another one. Yeah, I think I think we're in a good spot it. here. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left before we've got to wrap this one. So we're going to have to give quick answers, I think, on this. Uh, we should be in... Our third clip for charismatics will acknowledge that Old Testament prophets were held to a standard of 100 percent perfection. But they somehow say that, well, in the New Testament, prophets today aren't held to the same standard that the Old Testament prophets were. The charismatic scholar Wayne Grudem states that prophecy in ordinary New Testament churches was not equal to scripture in authority, but was simply a very human and sometimes partially mistaken report of something that the Holy Spirit brought. To someone's mind, man, these clips, two, two seconds off the end really makes a big difference. I tell you what. Uh, <laughs> yes. So he is he is right uh, that there are uh, a lot of charismatics who hold the uh, position that Old Testament prophets could prophesy infallibly. Wayne Grudem would be one that holds this position. And I would argue that it is the vast majority position of the charismatic movement that many, much of, most of, if you will, our scholars believe that there is a fundamental shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And at the beginning of the New Testament, the democratization of the Spirit and the weighing of that prophetic revelation has been democratized to the point uh, where we all get to participate in uh, the various activities, such as uh, the kingly role. Christ is king. He is seated on the throne. We're all seated in his kingly reign, and we're all uh, also, he's a priest, and we're all now a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, exercising his kingly and priestly authority throughout the earth through the democratization of that kingly and priestly role. <laughs> they would say, now, though they're, now Christ is our high priest, and we are priests, uh, the priestly role is fundamentally different than the priestly role was in the Old Testament. Priests today 
no longer uh, sacrifice animals. So there's a fundamental shift between the priestly Levitical system of the Old Testament and the priestly ministry of the New Testament. Uh, th these charismatics would go on to say that there's a fundamental shift between the kingly rule of the Old Testament and the kingly rule of the New Testament. The kingly rule of the Old Testament, uh, there is a kind of monarchical system, a theocracy, if you will, where there is a king who's governing one specific nation, the nation of Israel, but now there is a democratization of this kingly role, where Christ is certainly the king and head of the church, but now we are are all royalty in Christ, and we are administrating that kingdom role here on the earth, but not in one specific ethnic uh, group of people, but this is now uh, broadened throughout the earth. We are in all nations, all tribes and tongues. The kingdom is now being established, and there's a fundamental shift with the, doc uh, the, uh, the, the, the ministry of Christ's kingly and priestly roles that is being administrated through the church. They would then say, then therefore there is still a a uh, fundamental shift with the prophetic ministry. If there's a change with the king and the priest, why wouldn't it be the same that there's a changing in the prophetic ministry? The argumentation of Wayne Grudem and other scholars is that the fundamental shift that takes place is that the gift of prophecy is now uh, open for fallibility and error because all of God's people have this gift of prophecy. We all have the spirit. We're able to test it in a way that we couldn't in the Old Testament. That being said, uh, the three of us actually agree with the first two statements, I think, of kings and priests, but we do have a fundamental difference with Wayne Grudem and other charismatics when it comes to that third category. As you've already heard us say, we believe that there were prophets in the Old Testament who heard God and misunderstood God, and there were prophets who thought they heard God and spoke, and God said, no, no, I didn't speak, and they cleaned up their mess. So we actually think that there is continuity between the Old Testament and and the New Testament. So the, the view that Wayne Grudem holds and, and many charismatic scholars, we would call the discontinuity view, that there is a fundamental discontinuity and change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We would hold what is called a continuity view. We actually believe that prophecy functioned in like manner in the Old Testament as it does in the New Testament. The fundamental shift that we think takes place is democratization. It's given to all of God's people and not just a select few individuals that are called prophets. All of God's people can hear him. Uh, he speaks, he leads, he guides, prophecy, dreams, revelation, various other uh, ways God communicates. One of you guys want to pick up after that very long monologue? <laughs> no, that, that's good. Yeah, so uh, it would be inaccurate to say that all charismatics hold to the discontinuity view. Uh, we hold to the continuity view. Uh, we also have, we recently interviewed Dr. Tanya Harris, who holds to the continuity view. Jack Deere holds to the continuity. Craig Keener holds to continuity. And so charismatics are not a monolith in this. I, I think that it's defensible uh, what other, when others talk about a discontinuity view. And I, I think that their arguments should be contended with. Their arguments that we disagree with. And so our arguments were actually never dealt with in this film. Um, I, but, you know, either way, I, I like that in Grudem's quote, what he says is that the scripture holds ultimate authority. In my opinion, the continuity, continuity view is trying to like hold on to like scripture holds the ultimate authority. And so therefore, hey, there's this, this difference now and I can, I can maintain a higher view of scripture. But as one who holds to a continuity view, there's there's no reason why I can't in one breath say um, scripture has the highest authority of anything, like higher than any prophecy, as Paul says in the New Testament. If anyone is a prophet or thinks he is a prophet, let him ex acknowledge that what I say to you, Paul's writing scripture, is the Lord's command. And so Paul's saying this while prophecy is active in the Corinthian church. So there's no reason why I can't maintain that scripture holds a higher authority than the prophetic word. Um, you know, the scripture never says to test the scripture. No, I receive that as God breathed. But it does tell me in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Corinthians 14 to test the prophetic word. Um, okay, so in one breath, I can say scripture has a higher authority. And then in the next breath, I can say that it's been the same all throughout Old and New Testament that prophets could miss. And uh, and so like the same principle is just hold true. Like I, in other words, it doesn't follow. It doesn't follow that if 
I believe there is a discontinuity there that I therefore must have a lower view of scripture. That's, that's I, definitely not true. I would like to take a moment to be clear that we don't believe that the Old Testament um, canonized prophecies have any error in them whatsoever. It's really important in the same way that I would say that like Wayne Grudem and others would say the book of Revelation, though it is a gift of prophecy given to the apostle John, has no error because it is scripture. So when we look at um, uh, the, the scriptures themselves, we're not we're not placing like scriptures uh, the, that are prophesying the prophets. about the coming of Christ. There was right. no error in those. There might yeah, the, be the a narrative of the prophets story. have a different there might kind be a of narrative. authority in binding nature like the school of the prophets i don't think have the same kind of authority as jeremiah or isaiah because isaiah and jeremiah are writing scripture in the same way that the apostle peter or the apostle uh, john is writing the book of revelation um so there are indoctrinated scriptures i think you could probably compare this a lot like uh, the apostle paul he is teaching he is teaching in a letter no one is saying that teaching is infallible but Paul's teaching to the Church of Galatia that is written down in uh, letters, um, those those letters, those words that he's writing down are canonized. We're just saying in the same way that there are prophecies that God uses the gift of prophecy and that some of those prophecies are canonized. That So I want to make sure that that's clear and yeah. uh, we are not saying that any of the scriptures err in any way. Uh, Miller. For sure. Yeah, I've got to jump off. Uh, i got my meeting with my elders right after this. So I'll, I'll give this as my final uh, closing thought. Um, one of the things I, I like about Justin Peters and the cessationists is they're trying to protect the integrity of the scriptures, that the yeah. scriptures are the authoritative and they yeah. don't want that to be undermined. Honestly, I think that's the major battle that all cessationists are trying to fight. They're trying to protect the scriptures from another Joseph Smith coming around, uh, founder of Mormonism. Uh, and I'm I'm with them on that. I think they err in that they undermine the gifts of the spirit and they undermine the, the pneumatology and work of the spirit for the modern age. Um, and, and in doing so, it's a, it's a very, they're overreaching and this is a very egregious error because they're sort of neutering the, the work of God through the power of God. You know, they're removing the power uh, component of our ministry uh, by doing this. Now, that said, again, I like that they're trying to protect the word of God, but I think you can protect the word of God without having to throw away the gifts of the spirit. Um, like we just said, we do not think that prophecies given by a prophetic person or a person endowed with a prophetic gift are authoritatively on the same level as scripture. Um, Michael gave that passage already in 1 Corinthians 14, where you see both scripture and prophecies given being compared to one another. One meant to be accepted, that being the scripture, just taking carte blanche. The scripture is the word of God. Prophecies meant to be judged. And you see again in Thessalonians, you know, hold fast to what is good, abstain what is from what is evil. And this is in reference to a prophetic word given. And, he, and the other thing that's important there in that passage is he says, hey, don't despise prophecy. Well, what exactly are cessation is doing today? They're despising prophecy. And then what does it say right after don't despise prophecy? Don't quench the spirit which means to do one is to do the other. And so de facto cessationism by its very nature despises prophecy and quenches the spirit, which are two things we are told explicitly not to do. Again, I love that Justin Peters wants to protect the scriptures and the authority of the scriptures. I want to do the same, uh, but I don't have to throw away the gift of prophecy to do so. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's it. Good. Yeah, it's and also just to maybe give Ed Miller. Thanks for, joining us. Miller's going to go join his elders meeting now. Uh, we're all pastors. We have lives besides podcasting, just so you know. Uh, but just to give some comfort to maybe the person who's on the fence, who's like maybe nervous about the just, uh, not the Justin, the Joseph Smith, sorry, Justin, I'll never confuse the two of you. Uh, the Joseph Smiths of the world popping up and writing new books and uh, coming with these new re fancy revelations that contract the script. Here's the deal. And here's why continue. Like, it's not a slippery slope from continuationist to, to uh, Joseph Smith by any stretch. First of all, like all throughout church history, uh, the church has mostly been continuationist. That's first of all. But I, I would also say this, and here's what makes Joseph Smith a unique case. Uh, first of all, the Book of Mormon contradicts the Bible. And so 
the continuationist can say written revelation always trumps spontaneous revelation. So Joseph Smith comes around and Maroney told me this and uh, and I saw these golden tablets and here's the new book and and suddenly his new book says that Jesus is not the eternal God and the second person of the Trinity and suddenly his new book says uh, by the grace of God you're saved after you've done all that you can uh, and it teaches this salvation by works. His new book comes around and it teaches these anti-Christian, anti-gospel uh, teachings. You can say, okay, if a prophet supposedly, quote air quotes, prophet does that, they're not a prophet. Don't listen to that person. They're the one that's rising up, Deuteronomy 18, leading people away from the one true God. So one, Joseph Smith teaches against the scripture. Two, Joseph Smith adds to the scripture. And uh, continuationists are going to be against that. They're going to be against adding to the scripture. Hebrews uh, chapter one says that in times past, God spoke to us through the prophets, but now he has spoken to us through his son. And so we don't get any clearer than Jesus. And so I don't need Joseph Smith to come in and give me a new teaching about the ways of God, because I've already seen Jesus revealed in the scripture. And so that's why we say, hey, the canon is closed. We don't need to add to it. The window has been sufficiently defogged. I see clearly I see Jesus. And so and now to respond to the cessationist who says, yeah, exactly. That's why we don't believe in contemporary revelations anymore. And here's what I would say. Like the spontaneous revelations that I believe in are not adding to the scripture. They're not creating new teachings. We're not teaching through prophecy new things that Paul didn't know, new things that Jesus and the apostles didn't know. No, if anyone's doing that, they're adding to the Bible. That's not what continuationists do. Uh, or if they do, they are in error and uh, probably in heresy, okay? But like a true continuationist and the, you know, the vast bulk of the movement who haven't veered off into that kind of error are saying, no, the scripture is the ultimate authority. We're not adding to scripture. And if we do allow for spontaneous revelation, it's because the scripture teaches us to allow for spontaneous revelation. However, that spontaneous revelation is not binding on the conscience of all Christians everywhere or all people everywhere as the scripture is. It is categorically different. It might be God uh, speaking to an individual about this or that outcome. It is not God speaking to all individuals everywhere like the scripture does. It is not a new teaching. And that's what is unique about the scripture. So I would say uh, a continuationist with good doctrine is not going to be endangered by a Joseph Smith. And the greater danger is that we don't allow for spontaneous revelations. And therefore, we disobey the scripture and don't make space for God to speak to us and miss what he said. And so, uh, and so we're advocating for a position that says, Let's allow for spontaneous revelation, as the scripture says, so we can obey the scripture, make space for God to speak to us by the spirit as the scripture commands. However, let's not add new teachings to the Bible. There is a space in the middle. I want to appeal to those who are on the fence and say there is that kind of space. Yeah, and I, I know I've already said, you know, we are not saying that the Bible itself has any errors with prophecy when we talk about uh, prophets getting it wrong. I also need to be very clear that we are not making the case, and I think it might have already been stated before, but it's worthy of restating in case it, it has has already been stated, that we do not believe that God lies or that God gets things wrong. Uh, if there is a prophecy that goes forward and it is incorrect, there are a couple of options. One, God um, didn't give the prophecy. That's high probability, right? Two, the prophet heard God and misunderstood what was being said. I think that you can look at Acts, for example, where they urged him in the spirit to do something. It's clear that the spirit was saying there is danger ahead. And they interpret, they added some application to that that didn't come uh, from the Lord. Um, and then I guess finally, the, the other option is that there's something to be said of contingent prophecies. There are prophecies in the scripture uh, given typically over nations that when the whole nation repents of them, uh, that God relents over that disaster or uh, the inverse of that, or God promises blessing, uh, but then the nation goes into uh, immorality and evil and wickedness, and then God relents of that word. And I would say that would be the rarity, uh, not the norm. So 
the options that we have when a prophetic word is given and it's wrong, we talk in terms of this. We have a revelation. God speaks dream, vision, word, something to that effect. God speaks in, in the way that he speaks. We've already said riddle, dark saying, hard to comprehend frequent Bible verses that say this, okay? God's revelation. Then it's our interpretation, our trying to make sense of the word Peter on top of uh, 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 the, the Tanner's house. And he's trying to, he's perplexed. What does this mean? You have Daniel. He has this this vision, dream, and, and he's trying to figure out what it means. He prays and fasts to get the, the interpretation of that vision and dream. The bread baker, the cup bearer, uh, they have, or even the, 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 the Pharaoh over Egypt, they have dreams, but they don't know what it means. God is speaking to them, and there's this process of interpretation. So a revelation comes from God. There's an interpretation where human people are trying to figure things out, and then there's an application of how they're going to apply that to their life. So if a prophet gets it wrong, certainly it could not have come from God. It's totally possible that it didn't come from God at all. It's totally possible uh, that, that it was a contingent prophetic word. But even furthermore, if the prophetic word uh, was actually from God, there is still room for error in the interpretation of that revelation and also in the application, the way that we apply that revelation. So I uh, want to make sure that we go out of our way to explain that. But we are at time. We've got to wrap this up. Very excited to bring Dr. Michael Brown on our program next week to discuss these videos. So if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, like the video, and make sure to watch next week's program at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. We're going to be coming out with another video responding to cessationism. We've got great content coming up next week. We are interviewing Tim Mackey. Is that right, Michael? Tim Mackey on Monday? I yeah. believe so. Very excited for that. So you guys take the Bible stay tuned and, and jump in on that Bible Project interview where we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. If you want all of our notes from this cessationist response video and all of the other ones that we've done, I would encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter. There's a link for the newsletter in this video. We send out an email once a week. We don't spam you. We just let you know what's going on with Remnant when it comes to conferences, comes to courses, comes to deals that we're releasing for those things, but also study notes and resources and places to expand your learning, recommended books, blogs, those kinds of things. Check it all out in the newsletters once a week email. Uh, we encourage you to do that in the links below. Michael, anything else? Did I miss anything? That's it, man. That's it. So cool. sorry it wasn't live today. We're traveling tomorrow, which is today for you as you're watching it. Uh, we're traveling on Wednesday, so we pre-recorded this show. We like to interact with you guys in the live chat. But uh, yeah, guys, so thanks so much for joining us. God bless you. Find those links in the, des in the description and uh, stay tuned for more cessationist videos coming out soon. God bless you all. Have a great week.